This is Matthias Bohmbaum. In the year 2000, October of that year, I had the great privilege of being the master of ceremonies for the very first Reno Film Festival. During that festival, I got to speak with many wonderful actors, many of them now dead, including Kevin McCarthy and the great legendary actor who you will now see in this interview, Rod Steiger. It was a very intense interview, and he was very much in charge of the whole process while it was happening. But uh, it is an unforgettable look at a wonderful, wonderful performer. This interview was never broadcast, and I have the master tape, which I now share with you, which I think will be an insightful look at Rod Steiger uh, just a few years prior to his passing. So from October of 2000, my interview with Rod Steiger, which took place at the Bobinga Lounge at the El Dorado Casino in Reno, Nevada, during the course of the very first ever Reno Film Festival. Matthias Bombal with you from the first ever Reno Film Festival, here with Rod Steiger today, and delighted, so delighted to have you here today. Well, thank you. I'm very flattered to be here. Thank you. You've uh, mentioned earlier today uh, when you were with the mayor and getting your marvelous proclamation that you give memories throughout your career. Yeah, well, it, the, I was thinking uh, long ago one time, I mean, what, what does an artist in any uh, profession, what is the greatest thing he can give to another person? And that would be a constructive, warm memory because it gets into your brain, therefore into your life, so to speak. And that's it. When somebody says to me, I'll never forget, that's worth more than five Academy Awards. I'm in that person's life. So what was it made you decide to make the screen and the stage your career? Well, that's more of an intimate thing. Uh, it all goes back to when my family, we were in Newark, New Jersey, and my family was being destroyed by alcohol. Uh, and the biggest victim was my mother. And the neighborhood used to laugh at the name Steiger, and the kids were worse with their jokes, and the parents weren't much better. And I didn't realize to not too long ago that I got into this profession because I had to find a way, I thought, of regaining respect for the name Steiger. And if I worked very hard, people wouldn't laugh or make jokes about it. I was wrong, of course. <laughs> no, but they wouldn't laugh or make jokes about it. And that, to me, I realize now, plus the terror of failure. Uh, that's a great source of energy in any profession. If you have the character to control it and help it take that energy to help you create or produce in whatever profession you're in. Now, you were just out of the Navy, were you not? Yeah, I came out of the Navy. Yeah, I was uh, the day Japan surrendered, I got out of the Naval Hospital in San Diego. And uh, I came home. I only had one year of high school. I had nothing to contribute to society. I mean, but my generation believed that if you were any kind of a man, you made your own f uh, money for food and a place to sleep. We didn't go whining to people. They owed us something. And so somebody said, well, you know, the civil service is taking veterans. I said, great, let's, you know. So I got a job oiling machines and, uh, and washing the floors. And then we noticed uh, all the guys got together and said, what the hell's happening Thursday night? And everybody said, what do you mean? So all the pretty girls are busy on Thursday night, once a month. So we found out they had organized the theater group. And they had no men in the theater group. Needless to say, we descended like vultures. <laughs> and we all decided at that moment, yes, we are going to be actors. <laughs> and we went down uh, to get lucky with the girls. And I did one or two little one-act plays. And, uh, a woman named Poffrey, Rosanna Poffrey, said to me, you should take it serious. I said, you're out of your mind. What do you mean take it seriously? You're talking about the golden people you see up on the screen. I mean, these, I, you know, I had never seen a play. I would, and she said, yes, you should become. I said, well, I can't. She said, you should study. I said, I don't have the money to study. 
and she reminded me of something that millions of men forgot. After the war, they gave us a thing called the GI Bill of Rights. If you had been in the Navy for four years, I could go to any school I wanted in the country for four years. So immediately, <coughs> my intellectual mind said, it's better than working, <laughs> right? Better than working, I'm going to become an actor. And I went over to the New School of Social Research in New York, and I auditioned. I got one word out, but, and they said, fresh, wonderful quality, because they wanted to have the check from the government, which they knew would never fail. And then two months later, I don't know what happened. There was a catharsis of some kind, and I became paranoid about acting. They used to laugh at me. I had one of these airline, you know, the bags airline pilots take on with the history of theater, Stanislav Vaktanga, Boleslavsky, makeup, everything, you know. <coughs> and it became uh, my way of life. Did you have any influences at that early time? Someone that you looked up to that lend out a helping hand, or was it all? No, I was on my own then. And yes, on the screen there was a man like Paul Muni, you know, something like that. Also, uh, no, that was about it. I, I always thought he was the greatest. Then came the Philco Television Playhouse, where you became a sensation in the characterization of Marty. Well, that was interesting because <coughs> the thing I did, which I thought was uh, fairly intelligent, looking back at it, I said to myself, I'm not going to take or go look for a part for two years. If a mechanic has to learn the motor, if the mechanic, let me have the water, folks. I'm going to have water. Don't let that blow up the studio. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, if a mechanic has to know what uh, is going on, then an actor should have to know. So I studied one time I was going to the actor studio, New School of Social Research, and <coughs> excuse me, the American Theater Wing. So I was on stage once a week, uh, which is the only place you can define afterwards the intellectual process when you're on stage all of a sudden you say oh that's what they meant do you understand what i'm saying like i learned concentration but a young actor when he thinks he's concentrated he's like that he's eyeball to eyeball to you and if anything moves he goes crazy well i found out that isn't concentration is selecting something you want to make more important than anything at that given moment so I can talk to you now, I'm concentrating. I see the red light on that camera, the blinking one on that camera, my new wife in back of you, the lady over here, and the guy's watching over there, but I'm gonna clarify this to you. <laughs> that's concentration. Speaking of the new lady in the background there, that's uh, Joan Benedict Steiger. <laughs> Tell us about the, the new missus in your life. Okay. I am troubled. No, I, yeah. I knew this. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this uh, lovely lady when she was 19. And we dated for a while, then uh, life kind of separated us. And uh, then about two and a half, three years ago, uh, when I was a free man again, I got this lovely note and uh, a picture, and, uh, which I can't show on television, by the way, <laughs> and this picture. And um, we had a luncheon date. And uh, we've kind of been having luncheon dates and evening dates and morning dates ever since. You know. And then we got married. How marvelous. And here together for the first ever Reno Film Festival. How delighted we are to have you both. Well, I'm very pleased you have me here because I think Film Festival is our protection for the world of cinema in a way. Let's look at 1965. It brought you two really diverse roles. Uh, the part of uh, Kamarovsky in David Lean's Dr. Zhivago, and the nutty Mr. Joy Boy in Tony Richardson's The Loved One. Now, these roles were at opposite ends, absolutely the, the opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, could you comment on those? Well, I always Boy? thought that uh, an actor's supposed to be able to create different people. That's what I was taught. I mean, when I hear actors today say, well, I think that's bad for my image, I say, you poor SLB, you only have one image. <laughs> I don't understand that. And uh, I always tried to do things that were a little different. And if I got something that was a little similar, I tried to do it a little different. And uh, that to me, Joy Boy was a problem to me because he, was, uh, he wasn't gay. He was a kind of neuter gender. He, he, uh, I didn't know what to do until one day I was, when my first day of shooting, I was walking up a driveway because an actor never knows what's going to help him, never knows what's going to help him. 
That's why you have to keep your curiosity alive. And I'm walking up, and I see this concrete figure of a small Bacchus, the god of revelry, pouring wine, and it's all white and I said, my god, that's Joy Boy. That's what he should look like. Now I go ahead and I grab Tony Richardson, the director, I said, I've got to show you Mr. Job. He says, well, what are you talking about? He was very English. I said, well, I want to, uh, come look at this. <laughs> and he looks at it, and he said, my God, you're, it's too, he had an expression when he was pleased. He said, that's super. That's super, Rod. Absolutely super. And uh, so I had my hair made silver and white makeup and everything. And my problem was not to insult the homosexual community. What they want to do, or what we want to do, every man wants to do, or woman, that's their business. But I did not want to put him down or anything else. So I got away with it because he was really like a eunuch, you know. And uh, that to me was uh, a lot of fun. Zhivago was another thing. In Zhivago, I was the only American in it. And here I'm working with Alec Guinness, Rod, uh, uh, Ralph, Sir Ralph Richardson. Tom Courtney, a personal friend of mine who's a wonderful actor. And there's always been this misunderstanding in America that the American actor cannot play style. And I was happy because in that picture, I played style as well as anybody. But more important, I spoke as well as anybody in the picture. You give an actor with some kind of training the opportunity, he'll speak well, you know. And I was pleased with that, that I came out as part of the ensemble and didn't stick out like an American trying to have an English accent, because an English accent is not the correct way of speaking anyway. You have a big scene in that picture, right before you fall down the stairs where you're saying, we're molded from the same clay, the same clay. It's a tremendously emotional scene. How do you work yourself up into the emotion of such a scene? Oh, Lord, I don't know. I you see, what happened to Dr. Zhivago, the, my character, Komarovsky, was a man who was well-cultured, had art collection, had many women in his lives, and had no intention of ever getting involved with anybody. Comes along this little young girl named Laura, who he figures, good, we'll go away from the weekend, we'll have a good time, and life will go on. Then all of a sudden, he can't forget her. Then he falls in love with her. And I know people say to me, well, he was so mean. I said, mean? What poor son of a bitch travels back to warn you in front of the man who took you away from him that your lives are in danger? You going to condemn him as being bad? No. He was so in love that he even sacrificed his pride and went back and tried to try to save her with her lover standing alongside him. If you're looking down from Mars, you say, hey, he was, he was a pretty good guy. By the way, how is Mars? <laughs> 65 was busy year for you. What stays with you no. from making The Pawnbroker? Well, that's my favorite film. And that was very difficult because uh, I read the book. I read the script, of course, many times. And I said, what is going on? And I said, wait a minute. This is a man who feels guilty that he didn't save his wife and child from being annihilated by the Nazis. But the situation was impossible. If he had 10,000 men, he couldn't have saved them from being trampled to death in this box car. But he still has that guilt. He should have done something. So therefore, he's trying to exist in society without any responsibility which is impossible. And when I read the script, I said, wait a minute. I cut almost one third, more than one third of my lines. And uh, the director said, in the said, what are you doing? I said, well, my friend, if I'm not seen, I don't have to belong to society. If I'm talked to, I lo I'm looked at. And if I'm looked at, I have to deal with society. So that was the tough part of it. I love that, <laughs> you know. and. Also, there was a funny story connected, and that's in that picture there's a scene where he flagellates himself. He takes his hand and puts it down on the spike. You know the spikes, you know the spikes are supposed to hold bills. You put the bill on, you put, he puts his hand on it and forces it through his hand to punish himself because of this guilt he has. 
and I was at home for three days. I went crazy trying to get that thing. Oh boy, hey, and I got it, I thought. So now <laughs> we go to shoot, I get on camera, and I got it, it's going, it's right, they're moving in, I can feel it's right, and all of a sudden the voice says, okay, Jack, oh, what about practicing taking it off? Which I had forgot about. <laughs> Which I <laughs> so all I know is when I was in a lot of pain, sometimes I take a breath and go like that, you know. <gasps> and I got away with it. You talked about uh, striking lines from your script. Uh, you recently spoke with Robert Osborne that an actor can change a line, but not the intent of the line. Uh, would you comment on that? A, a good director will allow the actor to say the line any way that he's comfortable with, as long as the thought isn't changed, and the cue, the last two words, whatever it is, of the line. And in films especially, where you're trying to have a spontaneity, and sometimes because of technical things, or God knows what they do it over and over, you have a line like, come in, sit down. I'll say, come, you like coffee? You, no, forget it. I, why don't you sit down? I like the shirt you've got on. On the next take, I like the tie. How are you? look like my brother. It's funny, isn't it? Why don't you sit down over there? To keep it alive, because once they put it on the, t on the, on the film, it's there, you know. And the only thing is, until other people get used to me, they say, He's in, this guy's crazy. He's insane. You know. But that's how I try to get the spontaneity. And can you think of any specific examples that come to mind of, of situations where there were moments where the line change worked to the benefit of that moment? Of I can't remember the line, but I, have to, I guess I have to boast a bit. In Oklahoma, written by Rogers and Hammerstein, where a line hadn't been changed in 5,000 years. Especially Richard Rogers, who was very cool and tough on things like that. We're doing the scene and I said something, and he said, no, Rod, that's not the way it's written. And before I could try to defend myself, Hammerstein said, Richard, that's a better line. I was waiting for the explosion. He said, what? It's a better line. He never did, all right, leave it in, leave it in. That was my moment of glory in improvisation. Now, you've been a lot of historical personalities. Mussolini, you played that twice. Uh, Capone, Sam Giancana, and one of my favorites, W.C. Fields. Now, how does playing these well-known personages uh, differ from just a character you create out of the ether from a script? Well, it all depends. I mean, I played Rasputin and other people like that, and uh, Rudolf Hess and things. But when you play a person like Fields, unfortunately, everybody in the world thinks they can do W. Fields, <laughs> W.C. Fields. When I get in an elevator, the ele elevator rapper said, "Go on up or down, Mr. Steiger." You know, and I said, "I'd, I'd just like to go up two floors, would you please?" <laughs> and, but the thing that happened was that. I read everything I could read until they start to contradict each other. Then you have to begin to say, wait a minute. I saw all the films I could see of his, and then I decided for me, for my W.C. Fields, the bank dick was the essence of W.C. Fields' performing self. So I worked with that. And also I knew quite a bit, I got to know quite a bit about his personal life, you know. and. So that helped me a great deal. The most difficult moment I had in that film was when I came into work, and he had two ways of talking. Now, for instance, if you're interviewing him, you know, he talked to you like that. Well, I don't know, I was a crappy director. I had all that trouble all the time. And then if you were working, he said, I don't know, he was a crappy director. I had a lot of trouble with him all the time. He always got no, he just elongated, you know. Anyway, I'm coming in, I'm only supposed to do four lines that day, which means the actor's usually happy because, boy, four lines, I go home, thank God, right? And they said, uh, in this scene, you thank everybody for the show you just finished, and you leave. And we have the extras and everything. I said, I'm glad, I need somebody to talk to. You have to have somebody to relate to. 
So they said, oh, by the way, I want to tell you, one of the extras who will be right up front is Carlotta Monti. Now, she lived with Fields for some time. I said, Carlotta Monti? She's with him 14 years, the last years of his life. I, she's going to look at me and think I'm an idiot trying to be W.C. Fields. You don't tell an actor his mother's in the, th the character's mother's in the front row, you know. So I said to myself, well, all right. If she comes up and said, I like what you did for Mr. Fields, I missed by 4,000 miles. I like what you did for Billy, 8,000 miles. I like what you did for whatever, because he had a nickname that even a lot of the experts never knew. Intimate friends would call him Woody. And I didn't even see that in some of the books, but I found out. So when we finished the scene, <coughs> she comes over and she says, oh, Woody, 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 you're my Woody. Well, I didn't care what the critics said. I was crying, she was crying, we all, Woody, Woody, Woody. <coughs> I would imagine that you have a constant flow of scripts before you. What all depends on your age. No, no, Hollywood is merciless that way. I mean, you don't see many scripts with a leading character 75 years of age, I'll tell you that. I get, a, I get enough, you know, but mostly independent stuff because studios are interested. The market goes from 14 to 22. What are you going to do, you know? But I'm all right. I'm working. What's your criteria in saying yes on a script? Did it excite? It's the same... A part chooses you. I always think of a part as you go to a cocktail party and there's this very attractive woman. You say, boy, I'd like to get to know her better. I'd like to take her out. And it's, that's what happened. You get the, that's the exciting part. I'd like to get that. That looks like something interesting. It's uh, it, like that in a way. Could you comment on what the difference is between the stage and the screen for Rod Steiger as an actor? I don't have much of a difference uh, except projection. Uh, there is on the stage, and you can do it in movies too, but on the stage you can use your physical self more. For instance, if uh, you were doing like Death of a Salesman, and the curtain goes up and you see his figure like that, and it's a very tired, beaten figure. You can portray something before you start talking in that. In films, you know, you don't get a chance to get back that far in there. So little things like that. Are the, then again, in films, I've done it many times. You know, I, especially in live television, I used to do it all the time. They're going to come in for a close-up, and I said, fine. I sat like that, just like that, and said, listen, you, I want to tell you something. I knew it was a good picture. I also enhanced the character. So you fool around like that a little bit. Tell us about your brand new role as a decadent actor in the forthcoming The Hollywood Sign. Decadent actor, sir? Well, that's what they say. Decadent <laughs> actor? It's the nicest praise I've gotten in years, decadent actor. Anyway, what it is, uh, Burt Reynolds and uh, Tom Berenger and I, we play these uh, kind of over-the-hill guys who are desperately trying and to become stars still, and they're 9,000 years old apiece, and they're out of it. And it's kind of a comedy, but kind of a sad comedy. And uh, for me, to be in anything that has kind of a comedy thing about it uh, pleases me, because uh, no way to treat a lady in a strange way was it black comedy. And uh, I would call uh, this picture more of a human comedy, these guys. People still in love with a dream they can't possibly fulfill. That's the tragic part. But the other part is the wonder of the human being who insists he still can. That's what separates us from the animals. That and imagination. When you were making what are now considered now classic films, did you have any idea, like in movies like the In the Heat of the Night, that they would have a life in it beyond the life you gave it in its initial release? No, uh, an actor usually, when you do, you, I always put it this way, you know, I, my stomach tells me it's good. The general, the actors know this is pretty good material. Uh, when I did Marty, which is on one hour out of 365 days a year live from New York, 
I, I told Nancy Marshall, the actress who played with me, who unfortunately died recently, this is a good script. I said, yeah, this is a good script. We didn't know it was going to change television. We didn't know that this lonely person was going to touch from one coast to another. All we know was a good script. We thought we had done a good show. I didn't know. I got up the next morning. I had this $5 a week room on 82nd Street. I came downstairs. This woman's gone by with three poodles, and she says, what are we going to do tonight, Marty? Which was one of, my, one of the lines from the show, which was my cue. I said, I don't know. What are we going to do tonight? Garbage truck went by. Three guys said, what are we going to do tonight, Marty? I said, I don't know. What are we going to do tonight? I got to get my muffin and my tea at the cafe. The guy said, what are we going to do tonight? And I knew something had happened that we never dreamed of. I want to touch on a, a sensitive subject, if I may. You've had a really rough time with depression in your life, and yet you've come out of it with a message for others. It's not a sensitive subject for me. It's not a sensitive subject because I, I work with uh, Rosalind Carter, President Carter's wife, and some other people all over the country. And I have this thing I've written that I say, I will not, nor will she or anybody who's in this fight to get rid of the stigma against mental diseases, allow people to think that a person who's depressed is weird, queer, crazy, out of it, what have you. It's not true. Uh, in most cases, it's a chemical imbalance uh, that with a psychopharmacologist through talking and also finding the right medicine, and this is very important, for your chemical makeup. That's why I never mention the medicine I take. That's why I don't know what the hell Mike Wallace is doing, telling about what he takes. I hate that. Because if I give it to you and it doesn't work for you, you may stop. We have a potential drunk or a suicide here. You have to find out what fits your chemical makeup. So with that, uh, gradually, I, you know, I started to pull out of it. But again, pain must never be a source of shame. I wrote that in one of my poems. Never. It's part of life. It's part of humanity. What would be the greatest advice that you'd give people starting out in a career as an actor today? Well, this is going to sound crazy. I have kids come to me, like men, about 19 years of age, some of them. I said, uh, join the Merchant Marine for a year. And they look at me, what the hell is this guy talking about? I said, yes, for a year. You'll see different people, different countries, different foods, and what have you. Then go to New York and get into the best acting school you can. And the girls, I said, work, if you can, once a month or so in an emergency ward in a major hospital. So you get to know about people and differences and what life's about. Then go and study. I say this because I had four and a half years in the Navy. I never thought I was going to be an actor, an actor. And I have used things from my past. That's my farm of fertility as far as imagination is concerned. The Southern Acts and I, you and I played the sheriff. Right? You're going to do what I'm going to tell you to do. You're going to do it now. We've got a murder here. You understand that? We've got a body who's dead and the murder here. A guy named King on the ship. That's the way he used to talk. I remember saying, someday I'm going to kill the captain. I'll tell you, Rod, I'm going to kill the captain someday. You know. So that experience is very, uh, very important. Well, I certainly hope that you'll be enjoying the first ever Reno Film Festival. We're so honored in having you here. Rod Steiger, especially in the company of your lovely wife. Incidentally, should you kiss on your first date? Huh? Should you kiss on the first date? What you should do on the first date, I'm not going to describe, my <laughs> friend. I thank you. And right. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.
This is this was supposed to be the basketball. That's good. That works for me. DJ, how does that look? Looks great. Okay, you might have to have to go Iris up. Okay, we're we're gonna we're gonna move down the road here. Okay, is everybody ready? You guys ready? Yeah, set? We're ready. Set. You got audio checks? Audio set. <laughs> okay. Quiet on the set. Matias in church. Thank you. 